we will start. Uh, welcome. Page one. We'll worship the king. Page one.
Morning, church. Good, morning. Good to see everyone. We're glad that we're able to be here again with you this morning. And I uh, want to thank Steve for his uh, message this morning. Uh, a short story about Hank uh, Skaggs. Um, when Melissa, uh, my wife, and my mother and I drove from Illinois and we had our U Haul van, was it U Haul or Penske or what? Yeah, U Haul. U -Haul. And we drove that big thing. We got all the way to Winnemucca. Beautiful weather, 80 degrees most of the way until we hit Winnemucca. And then it started snowing. <laughs> and so we didn't know which route to take, go up into Oregon and come down or come down through Reno and then up. And so uh, Chad Hilger, who was uh, one of the elders at Crescent City Church of Christ, he said, well, here's Hank Skaggs phone number, call them and see what the weather's doing there, and then they can kind of advise you which way to go. So I took the number, and, and we called, and they said, well, why don't you just come on down to Reno and stop in at our house, and you can have some dinner with us, and then we'll decide what to do from there. And so it started blizzarding. Blizzarding? Is that a word? It started to blizzard. 
And uh, they said, well, you're going to stay the night here tonight. And very hospitable to us. And the next morning, Hank uh, had to go. Well, he didn't have to. He wanted to go and do the food service, even though there was a couple of feet of snow on the ground and everything. They just, him and Ruby both said, well, you guys stay here. Get whatever you want out of the refrigerator. Watch TV. Do whatever you want. They didn't know us from Adam. Never met us before, but they were gracious enough to open up their home to us uh, and let us be there and uh, just be at home while they were uh, doing their ministry for the Lord. And uh, over the years, uh, they would come down July 4th weekend and uh, spend time with the Hilgers, and we got to be uh, become good friends with them. And so uh, I really appreciated Hank and, and, and still uh, talk with Ruby once in a while. And, so great examples uh, of faithful servants in the Lord, and, and I really appreciated how welcoming and uh, you know, hospitable they were toward us. And that kind of encouraged my wife and I to uh, open up our home whenever there was a missionary or someone that needed a, a place to stay the night while they were traveling through. Uh, and so my mother-in-law would say, why are you letting strangers stay in your house? Well, that's what people did for us, and that's what God would have us to do for them. And so, so we've uh, been impacted by Hank and Ruby's life and their ministry uh, as well. So I appreciate uh, your message this morning. So that has nothing to do with the message that I'm going to bring this morning. Uh, this morning's message I've entitled, Rich Man, Poor Man. Rich Man, Poor Man. And our main text is in Luke, the 12th chapter, verses 13 through 21. Luke 12, 13 through 21. Now, in a previous text, uh, Jesus warned his disciples against the yoke of the Pharisees, or the yeast of the Pharisees, which was hypocrisy. He told them to be careful that you don't fall into the same thing, where you are preaching and teaching one thing, but yet your life is quite different. And that's what the Pharisees were doing. They were teaching these rules and these traditions, but yet they themselves were not following their own teachings. And so Jesus was addressing not only the disciples, but they were thousands of people following Jesus, and he's teaching them. Now, as he's addressing the crowd, a certain man issues an interesting request of Jesus. And Jesus uses that request as an opportunity to tell a parable and to warn the thousands of people in the crowd against greediness. So not only hypocrisy earlier on, but now the subject of greediness. And so the problem that Jesus addresses here is not owning possessions, but rather being owned by our possessions. And that's what happens when we start having that desire to gain wealth, is that wealth can take possession of us rather than us being in control of it. And so the person who desires wealth is tempted to make its attainment the top priority in the, his or her life. And when that person has acquired wealth, he or she spends their entire life trying to guard and increase that wealth. Now, we are tempted to believe that we can find true security in wealth. You know, the more money, the, the, the nicer the home, the, you know, all the insurance that we can buy up, all these things, we can be secure. We can be safe. However, when we place our faith in money, it crowds out our faith in God. And we start depending on those temporary things then, rather than spending time focusing on God and trusting Him to provide and care for us. And so it's not money that's the problem. As the Apostle Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10, 1 Timothy 6, verse 10, he says, for the love, it can also be translated as greed or covetousness. 
For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. He says some people eager or craving or desiring for money have wandered from the faith and have pierced themselves with many griefs. We can bring in a lot of trouble into our life when we desire to gain wealth at any cost. See, greed leads to all kinds of problems. It can lead to marriage problems. It can lead to robbery or killing and all kinds of other things. And so to master greed, you must control it at its root. You have to get rid of that desire to be rich and learn to be content and then use whatever wealth you have in service to others and to God. Give him the glory for what you have. So before we get into the main text, let's go to God in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given us to be encouraged and strengthened through the preaching and teaching of your word. Father, we pray that our hearts and our minds, as well as our ears and our eyes, will be open to your word. Father, help to Help us to be illuminated by your word so that we can do what it says. Father, help us not to become greedy and to become lustful after wealth. But Father, help us to be content with what you have provided for us. Whatever wealth we may have, help us to be able to be generous with it to others that are in need and to give you all the glory, praise, and honor through what we do. Father, we ask that you be with me this morning, that you would help me to communicate your word clearly and effectively as I should for your glory. Father, help us to live our lives as an example of how generous you are with your resources. Father, may everything that we say and do be pleasing and glorifying to you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. So if you have your Bibles and you haven't turned there yet, go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 12, verses 13 through 21. Luke 12, 13 through 21. And again, I'll be reading from the New International Version. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me judge or an arbitrator between you? Then he said to them, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed or covetousness or excessive desire for wealth. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. You know, that's what the world tries to tell us, that those who have the most toys win, those who have the most money and the most power, they're the ones in control, and they are the ones that make the rules. But Jesus says, that's not true. Our lives do not consist in the abundance of our possessions. He goes on to say, by telling them this parable, the ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. In other words, an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. In other words, all his surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy. In other words, relax or retire. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get all that you have worked hard for, all that you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not rich towards God. 
Now, the first lesson that we learn in this passage is that greed sidetracks love. Greed sidetracks love. In verses 13 through 15, we, we see this lesson. Now, the law of Moses prescribed rules for inheritance. And rabbis or teachers were expected to interpret the application of the law in specific instances and then to arbitrate any disputes. Deuteronomy 21 verse 17 provides a double portion of the inheritance for the firstborn son. Now if there were two sons, the elder son receives two-thirds or 67% of the inheritance, and then the second son would receive one-third or 33%. And so this man's issue is not the amount that he had inherited, but it seems that he was upset with the fact that his father left the inheritance to both sons. And so they were jointly uh, holding on to this or receiving this inheritance. And so this son didn't want to share the inheritance with his brother. He didn't want joint ownership. He wanted to be independent from his brother. And so his love of money was more important to him than his love for his brother. And how many people do we see today that the love of money is more important than the love of their physical brothers, but also maybe even their spiritual brothers and sisters in Christ? Well, while the man addresses Jesus as teacher, notice that he does not request instruction. Lord, Tell me, teach me what I should do with this inheritance that my father is leaving me. He doesn't do that. He doesn't want to know how is the best way for me to honor God with this increase into my life. He doesn't do these things. Instead, he tells Jesus what he wants. And he asks, or rather he commands Jesus to do his bidding. He wants to take advantage of Jesus' moral authority and to use that authority to gain power over his brother in the dispute over their inheritance. Now, Jesus' reply echoes the language of Exodus chapter 2, verse 14. You, you probably remember the story. Moses has been raised as one of the sons of Pharaoh. And one day he sees two uh, Hebrews, his own people that, that he was born into. And they got into some kind of argument, some kind of fight, and, and Moses tries to break it up. And this dispute happens, and, and one of the men asked Moses, who made you ruler and judge over us? And so we see Jesus He's saying pretty much the same thing. Who, who made me judge or arbitrate between you and your brother? Now, Jesus could mean that he didn't have the authority to arbitrate this dispute between the two brothers. But more than likely, he is questioning this man's right to involve him into the dispute. Kind of reminds me of what Jesus said to his mother Mary in John chapter 2. When they were at the wedding in Canaan, and Mary discovered that they had ran out of wine. And so she goes to Jesus, and his response is, dear woman, why do you involve me? You know, I'm not in charge of the banquet. I'm not in charge of, of the drinks and the refreshments. Why do you involve me? My time has not yet come. Of course, he was talking about revealing himself as the Messiah. And so Jesus' response to this man is very simple. Man, why do you involve me? Who made me the judge or an arbitrator between you and your brother? And so Jesus addresses the man's question or the man's request. And his request was self-interest. It was all about him. And it clashed severely with the context in which Jesus uh, was teaching. 
And so Jesus had been teaching people by the thousands according to chapter 12, verse 1. And he warned the disciples within his hearing that uh, these people who have this self-righteous hypocrisy, you need to be watching out for them. And don't allow them to drag you into their hypocrisy. And now he told them, you know, watch out for greediness. He told them earlier to watch out for those who can kill the body. He said, rather, be afraid of the one who can kill both body and soul in hell. In verses 4 through 5. And he encouraged them to profess Jesus before others in verses 8 and 9. And he told them that they would face opposition, but he assured them that the Holy Spirit would give them the right words to speak whenever they were brought before the authorities in verses 11 and 12. Now those authorities could either be the city officials or the, the government officials, or it could have been the spiritual authorities. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, uh, the Sanhedrin. Don't worry about what you're going to say, for the Holy Spirit will give you words to speak. And so in the middle of all these serious concerns, the man interjects Jesus' teaching with a request for help from his, for his inheritance. You know, he could have went to anybody else and said, hey, I need help in this financial matter. But he went to Jesus. And Jesus was teaching these very serious subjects. And in doing this, this man reveals that he hadn't heard anything that Jesus had been teaching. And we don't know if he was there for a long time or if he just happened upon this big crowd. But he didn't hear what Jesus said because he was so concerned about his own personal problems. Now, we probably all know people like that. They don't care about what's going on in your world. They don't care about what's going on in other people's lives. They're only concerned with their own personal issues. I need to find help for what I'm going through. And they can care less about anyone else. This man was pretty much the same way. And so his outburst is trivial by comparison of what Jesus was teaching. And so it was inappropriate and disruptive. And so Jesus, who sees the heart, he could see the condition of this man's heart in verse 15. And so he addresses his reply, not just to the man himself, but also to them, to the crowd. He uses it as an opportunity to teach about the danger of greed. And so Jesus says in verse 15, a man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. You know, you're focusing on a lower priority than what I'm trying to get the others to focus on. This is minimal in the grand scheme of things. And so the man has so narrowly focused his attention on possessions and wealth that he really sees nothing else in life. And so Jesus calls him to, to pull back and take a, a better look at life from a fresh perspective so that his whole life can come into view. Now that's a practice that will put possessions into their proper perspective. They'll still be in the picture, but they will seem smaller once we get to see all of life in its proper view. And so Jesus turns the discussion from this man's inheritance to his real need. Oftentimes when people think that something is the main issue in their, their life, that's really not the problem. There's usually something deeper that is the greater problem. And that's what he does. He sees his true need and and he tells him and everyone else to guard himself against the dangers of greed and to take the opportunity to become rich toward God in verse 21. It's better to be rich toward God and be the poorest person in the world 
than to be the richest person in the world and forfeit your soul. And so Jesus is telling us, don't allow greed to sidetrack your love for God and for your fellow man. Because greed will sidetrack your love. The second lesson that we learn in this text is that greed suspends stewardship. Greed suspends stewardship. Verses 16 through 19. Jesus now tells the man and the thousands that are in the crowd a parable. And he introduces the parable by saying the ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. Now notice that the man in the parable was rich prior to this harvest. And the harvest just simply increases his wealth. And so Jesus portrays this as a windfall harvest, as an abundant harvest or a bumper crop, which exceeds the rich man's uh, investment in the planting and tilling of the soil. And so it's a harvest that was truly a gift from God. Man hadn't expected that he was going to receive such a great crop. And as we will see, the abundant harvest raises the question of stewardship. What responsibility do we have when we acquire more than what we need? Well, the New Testament speaks a great deal about the responsibility to be generous in giving to the needs of others. About blessing others because we have been blessed by God. Therefore, as we have received freely from God, we are encouraged to freely give from ourselves. And so we see that Jesus is saying that the antidote to greed is in giving. It is when we give that we are freed from that desire and that lust of greed. We see all throughout the scripture that God is a giver. He's given us life. He's given us families. He's given us ability to work and to make money and to make a living. He's given us spiritual blessings. And most importantly, he's given us of his son, Jesus. And when Jesus returned back to the Father, he gave us the Holy Spirit that lives within us to guide us and teach us and direct us in the way that we live. And so he is the great giver, and no one can outgive God. And so he wants us to learn to give so that we can become more like him. See, the early church will become known and characterized by their generosity to help those who were in need, so that no one had too much and no one had too little. And so Jesus commands us to be good stewards of God's riches and his blessings. Now, we said last night that a steward or a manager is one who is given authority or responsibility to take care and to manage the resources that belong to someone else. And so this role is one of that of a middleman. It doesn't belong to him, but he has authority and responsibility to take care of it for another. And so a manager or a steward works for the owner. And so he's a servant. And so Jesus will speak more about this later on in, in Luke chapter 12, verses 42 through 44, that we looked at a little bit last night about the wise and the faithful manager who gives the other servants their proper food at the right time. <laughs> And how it will be good when the master comes home to find that servant doing so when he returns. And then he will put him in charge of all his possessions. Well, a good steward is a servant who is mindful that Jesus will return at any time. And it's the person who behaves like he is a servant who will be held accountable for his care of others. However, in this parable, we see that this rich man was not a good steward. Rather, he was a bad one. 
And a bad servant uses resources for self-indulgences and abuse. He mistreats those who are entrusted to his care. And his consequences are harsh. Because we see that God cares deeply about his people. And everyone who has ever abused God's people have had some kind of terrible punishment for doing so. And so what God says about stewardship is that a good steward is the one who values people over personal financial gain. We care more about people than we do about possessions. And so what are possessions? What is wealth? It's just a resource to be used to help others and to give glory to God. So when we invest in others, we share God's work. And when we do that, his kingdom grows. And so your money is just another resource that can be used to help further the kingdom of God and the greater calling in loving others and loving and sharing them and sharing with them the gospel. Now back into the parable in verse 17. The rich man says that he thought to himself. I want you to notice that the man talks with nobody in this parable except for himself. He doesn't have any care or focus on anyone else to seek counsel from. He doesn't have a, a personal advisor that, that tries to help him with his money or, or anyone that he can go to for counsel. He doesn't even go to God for counsel. And so he asked himself in verse 17, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Does that sound familiar? I think each and every one of us wake up in the morning, walk into our closet, look at the hundreds of clothes that are hanging on the rack. I just don't have anything to wear. Yes, we do. Or we'd have an empty closet. Now, we may not like what we have to wear. We may have grown a little tired of wearing those same things. But we have something to wear. And the same thing, this man had places to put his crops, to store them. Basically, what he's saying is, I've run out of space to store all this extra that God is blessing me with, although he wouldn't admit that that's what's happening. I just don't have enough space for that. You know, that's why self-storage is like a multi-million dollar business, <clears throat> because we have so much stuff that we don't have enough space that we have to go rent a building, put it all into, and very rarely will we ever go and check out what's inside that storage unit, you know? And so years and years will go by and we find out, I really don't need that. You know, it's, it got molded. It got ruined while it was in the storage. And then we're, oh, what a waste. But that's what this man is saying. I just, I don't have any more storage space. Now, most of us would be glad to be in this man's position and to have more wealth than we know what to do with. This man, he certainly seemed glad that he had this problem. However, money is really all that he has. He mentions nothing about family or friends. He doesn't say, you know what? Instead of tearing down these barns and building bigger ones, I have friends and family that I can help out. Sell these crops and, and give the proceeds to them. He doesn't say anything like that. He has no sense of community. Caring about others around him that might be in need. He has no desire to help the poor and to donate to worthwhile charities. He doesn't say, you know, I have so much abundant food that I'm never going to get to that. I have enough food already that's going to last me a lifetime. I'll take this down to the local food pantry and, and those who don't have enough to eat, they can benefit from this. He says nothing of these things. 
He is rich in money, but he's poor in everything else. So he's truly a rich man, poor man. Well, he goes on to say to himself in verse 18, this is what I'll do. Now notice that he's making his own plans. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And so the abundance of the harvest exceeds his expectations, requiring a quick decision regarding either storage or disposal. How am I going to store the abundant crop or how am I going to get rid of the crops? And of course, he decides he wants to keep it. Now, I want to make clear that Jesus never suggests that this man came by this great harvest dishonestly. Doesn't seem like he did anything wrong. That he, he didn't go and harvest on a neighbor's field. He didn't do anything. He didn't misuse or abuse his, his tired hands. However, the first hint of a problem lies in the man's use of the first person pronoun. You can see the man's self absorption by the words I and my and how frequently he uses it. Now, in this short conversation with himself, he uses the word I six times. And the word my five times. And so we observe that he gives no thought to a bonus to his hired hands. It never occurs to him to think, you know, my workers really worked hard during planting season. They really worked hard during the harvest to bring in this abundant crop. I really ought to give them a bonus this year. That thought never occurred. He never thought about those hired hands who did all the work that he benefited from. He never thought about doing something of a service project for the community. Like I said, he didn't go down and, and donate his proceeds or donate his uh, abundant crop to the food pantry. He doesn't even offer a word of thanksgiving to God for this terrific harvest. I wonder how many of us take time to thank God for the blessings in our life. Or do we just go along with life? It's mine. I did this. I accumulated this. See, with this man, everything is I and mine. And what we and that man need to understand is that God has blessed us so much. You know, we live in one of the most affluent countries in the world. The poorest among us are among the richest in the world compared to third world countries. We have things that we take for granted that people are dying to have just a little bit of. And yet, we gripe and complain. And we want more and more. See, God has blessed us and he says... I don't want you to forget that I am the owner and I have given you an ability and I'm the one who has given you the ability to be creative, to produce, to work, to invent and to change and develop or manage. That's what I put you here for. And I get the pleasure out of watching you do a good job. Don't forget that I'm the owner and you're responsible to me. So never forget that the Lord your God is the one who gives you the ability to produce wealth. I read about a church that had grown so rapidly that they ran out of space in their parking lot. And instead of just deciding, well, we'll go to two or three services so that we can make the parking work, they went across the street to a local supermarket and they asked them about their parking lot because the store was closed on Sundays. And so somehow they, they struck a deal with the owner of the supermarket and he said, I'll let you use the parking lot 51 Sundays out of the year. 
And on the 52nd Sunday, he'll be chained off. Well, of course, the, the church was confused by that. And they said, we, we don't understand. Why would you do that? Why would you allow us to use the parking lot 51 times a year and then chain it off on the 52nd? And the store owner replied, because I never want you to forget that the parking lot belongs to the supermarket and not to the church. And that's what God wants us to learn. All that we have belongs to God. It doesn't belong to us. He's just letting us use it. And he requires us, he asks us, he commands us to give back a portion of what he's allowed us to use back to him. Gratefully acknowledging that he is the owner and the giver who has given us everything and blesses us every day. Now I want to read verse 19 from the English Standard Version. This rich man says, soul, which is the word uh, suke, and it's talking about the inner man, the spirit within us. And so he's saying, self, this is what I'm going to do. You have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. Those three phrases are basically the theme song of the world. <clears throat> eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you will die. And many people don't believe that there's life after death. And so they think, you know, I just need to live it up. Enjoy all that the world has to offer. Because once I die, that's it. And we find similar uh, words being used by Solomon in his book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 2, 3, 5, and 8. He talks about eat, drink, and be merry. But Solomon expresses that true enjoyment in life comes only when we follow God's guidelines for living. When we are living according to God's word and his will, when we are living in a relationship with God, that's when we can enjoy life. We see a purpose and a meaning in our life. And so the results of our work can be enjoyed because it's a gift from God. Without that, satisfaction is a lost search, a chasing after the wind, Solomon says. Now, Jesus clearly portrays and represents this man's self-absorption or presents his self-absorption. Uh, he has more than enough than he needs in fact, he has more than he needs to live in luxury. This rich man is richer than most rich men. He's got an abundance. He doesn't need all of it. And so in his mind, his future could not be more secure. Now all he has to do is just enjoy his wealth. And that's his plan. However, we're going to find out that his plan will soon fail. And so Jesus is telling us, don't allow greed to suspend your service and your stewardship to God. The third lesson that we see in the text is that greed shifts focus. Greed shifts focus in verses 20 and 21. And so I want to ask you and myself, where is our focus? Where is our focus? Is it living for temporary pleasures? Is it trying to fill the empty areas and spaces of our lives with the pleasures of the world? Do we not recognize the temporary nature of life that we could be gone in an instant? As the writer says that your life is but a mist or a vapor that appears for a little while and then it's gone. See, the things of this world are temporary. Is that where our focus is? Or is our focus on the things that are eternal, the things of God? 
And so the dividing line of this parable is the challenge to become rich towards God. And we see what this man's focus was on. He was focused on self, stuff, and satisfaction. I want to think about myself, do whatever brings me uh, the most stuff into my life, the most possessions, the most wealth, and then I'm going to be satisfied with it. I'm going to enjoy that. But verse 20, God has different plans. God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself but is not rich towards God. So the man said, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. But God says, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. You're planning for a long life, but your life is about to be cut short. And so the man is a fool. Those are God's words, not my words. We have to be careful that we don't call people fools because that's not our place to do so. That's God's place to do Decide who's foolish. We can say, you know, they're not behaving very wise. They're, they're being foolish in their behavior. But be careful that you don't call people a fool. Only God has the right to say that. And the reason why God says that he's a fool is because he has failed to take into account his own mortality. And it will claim him that very night. Then you will get what you have prepared for yourself. Now, there's nothing wrong with working hard so you can provide an inheritance and provide for your children or grandchildren. There's nothing wrong with that, but that's not what this man was doing. It was all for himself. He didn't want to share it with anyone else. But we cannot take our possessions and our wealth with us when we die. I have yet to see a U-Haul being pulled behind the hearse. You know, I haven't seen one of those little storage units right next to the grave site. We can't take it with us. When we go, if we haven't, you know, willed it, willed it, W-I-L-L-E-D, will, not, there's no H in that. <laughs> That's the Midwest in it. But if we willed it to somebody else, uh, you know, they may get it, they may not, depending on courts. But if we haven't willed it to anyone, who's going to get it? Someone else is going to enjoy the labor or the fruits of your labor. We can't take it with us. And so people love possessions so much that they guard them jealously. They maintain tight control of them. They put up barriers so that no one can get access they provide wills and charitable foundations, but those things only provide minimal protection. And fortunes are often spent in ways that the founder never envisioned and would never have approved. And eventually, as Jesus says, rust and moth corrupt even the most prized possessions. And Jesus says, this is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself but is not rich towards God. We should be storing up treasures in heaven <clears throat> rather than treasures on earth. And we should not assume that this verse applies only to those who are millionaires. No, we don't have to be wealthy to be in danger. And so the trouble applies to any person who lays up treasure for him herself and is not rich towards God. And so again, the problem is not the man's wealth, but it was his selfish hoarding. And some wealthy people are tempted to hoard money and stocks and bonds, and there are others who just wastefully spend and don't have a care, you know? We've seen people that like these big cigars with $100 bills. Just wasteful. 
However, poverty does not make one immune from selfishness. Some poor people share unselfishly with people who are in need, but others hoard a single piece of bread. So the problem is not their wealth, but their selfishness. And it's entirely possible that someone who is rich and may drive around in a Porsche can be very generous with their money. And someone who is driving around in a Ford Pinto, if you can still find those things, may be very greedy and hoarding, you know, a pan of brownies. So you can't go by just who's rich and who's not. So what does it look like to be rich toward God? Well, first, it means being thankful to God for our blessings. Each and every day, we need to be thankful. The Bible tells us that God's mercies are new every morning. Every morning is a new opportunity to be blessed by God. And it's an opportunity for us to render our thankfulness to the one who has blessed us. Second, it requires stewardship that returns God's portion to God. We need to give back a portion of the many blessings that God has given us as a way to say thank you and a way to acknowledge that our dependence is upon you. You are our giver. You are our provider. And we trust you. Thirdly, it means giving generously to our neighbors whom Jesus charged us and commanded us to love, but also to our enemies whom Jesus also charged us to love. So the question is, have you given in to the temptation of greed? Is your love sidetracked from others to be centered on acquiring wealth for yourself? Is your stewardship suspended because you view the resources as belonging to you rather than to God? Is your focus shift, shifted from eternity to that which is temporary? If you answered yes, he, Jesus' is warning to become rich toward God before it's too late. And your soul is demanded of you before you least expect it. Those are things that Jesus wants us to ponder and to put into application. So if you need to make sure that you are investing your life to become rich toward God, make sure that you do so. Thank you for your attention and your Amen. listening. Amen. This all be standing three hundred seventy. Three hundred seventy. Count your blessings. Three hundred seventy.
you, Steve, and thank you, Mark. Just want to let everybody know, um, for those that want to continue to look at the sermons after this rally, if you go on our Facebook page, you can actually rewatch this, which is an amazing tool that we have in our world. And, uh, and uh, some people from St. Helens said hello that are usually here, and also from Reno, so they're watching as well. So we're so thankful. And thank you, Mark. And, uh, you know, the best thing about rallies is first, learning more about Jesus Christ. <laughs> Secondly, is being with family and friends and fellowship. And third is the food. (laughs) We have plenty of food. So I encourage you, everyone, please stay for the potluck. Um, We have two tables in the back. And then Sister Sherry says we're going to put two tables in the foyer so we don't have to move the chairs in here. And we have some folding chairs for any of you guys. David, if you don't mind helping out, and whoever would like to help out with that, that'd be great. They're in the back, and we'll say getting started on it right now. So, (laughs) anyways, please stay for the potluck. And also, if you don't like the bowl and still want a fellowship, come on down to North Bend Lanes. It's a beautiful facility there. My buddy, um, I've known forever since I was a kid. He has a beautiful outdoor deck with cornhole. Anybody like cornhole? They have cornhole. Beautiful scenery, and it's a great place to do to continue our fellowship and this weekend. So, and then uh, once we're all set up, I'll probably have Brother Derek lead us in prayer for the potluck. Probably we'll do that later. But let's go ahead and still pray. And uh, Paul, you want to lead some prayer? Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this, another day of life and for the many, many blessings you give us and for these great messages we've heard this morning and for all you do for us each and every day. We just pray you'll continue to watch over and keep us and be with us as we do other things today and keep us safe and we just pray again for your love and care. Pray this in Christ's name, amen. Amen. All right. Stay to help out, and then uh, Derek will lead us to prayer for our food here shortly. Thank you. What a blessing um, you are. Uh, you got it all straight out. Each Thank you, David. Thank you. Don't change. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sometimes it's going to take a big boom somewhere, but people will come. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, when we first started, we had probably about six, 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 six